Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Um, as per usual, you know, we do, we do appreciate that um, most people are in practice and trying to start at one o'clock. Uh, there's definitely some people right now who want to be on the webinar, but they're trying to get that patient out of the practice or the uh, uh, or the dentist is just running a little bit over because they wanted to do that emergency off the back of that appointment or something, something along those lines. Um, so hello, everybody. There's a lot of hellos here. Um, let's go down the list and see who's here. Oh, we've got Rian here. Hi, Rian. Nice to see you. Um, just going down the list to see. You don't get the full list, which is Big Mark is such a better piece of software than the one we used for years. Uh, but we used to, I used to be able to see the entire list. Now I get a kind of a limited list. So, so if I'm not saying your name, it's because I can't actually see you. So uh, for anyone who knows me personally, if you want to say hi in the chat, then I'll, uh, then I'll say hello as well. Um, so what we're going to do is, is we're going to start, for anyone who's new to the webinars, we say one o'clock, but we know that people are going <clears> to, <throat> people are going to be stuck in surgery and whatever. So we're going to start at, um, I'm going to start at five past. So you've got four minutes uh, to, Go and get yourself some water, sandwich, quick break, some vodka, whatever you need to get through the day. <laughs> I've, I've got, I've got coffee. Mm, um, I went for coffee. Allegedly. So the, uh, but no, this is. Uh, I went for. I went to my Nespresso machine and made a coffee. So. So this is a. Well, I'll do that in the intro, but I'll say a little bit about it now. This is um, our first partnership webinar, which is uh, really oh. great with with our with Louise our Fry's here. I know Louise Fry. Sorry? Louise Fry's here. Ah, okay, brilliant. Um, so we, yeah, so this is our first, and we we picked one of our favourite partners to start with, um, who who I always bump into at every show. I think Laura deliberately puts her stand near the Agilio stand. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Or it might be the other way around. Maybe we deliberately put ours near, near yours, Laura. I think so. that's what it is. That's what it is. Um, so, um, yeah, I wonder what else I can tell people whilst we're waiting. Um, I'll, I'll double check the list to see if there's anyone else who... Oh, Sally's here. Hi, Sally. And Hannah. Great. For those people, I mean, we've got, oh, what can I say without giving too much away? We've got a very exciting year of development. I think most people here are probably iComply subscribers. We've got a very exciting year of development ahead of what we've got a, a full uh, a full roadmap for the next 12 months of adding a lot of um, digitizing some really fun stuff in iComply. We just released the, actually, that might be a good question to ask people. For those of you who, who've got iComply right now, have you been using the new quick check forms for uh, your med for your uh, medical emergency drugs or your, uh, and also we put on their complaints records and et cetera, surgery checklists. How, how are people finding the uh, the new checklists? There's a, Laura, just so you know, there's about an eight second delay or something. So you'll, if you ask a question, it will, uh, you have to wait. But, Got you. Uh, I think I don't know if it's an eight second delay, but exactly. So some people are using them. I think some people aren't using them. They are. You're finishing using the booklets first. That's that's good. I mean, for those people who do like booklets, who like physical logbooks, uh, I don't think I don't think everyone knows that actually we we. Uh, we've made them cheaper for people who subscribe to them. So if you're using a logbook every six months for your autoclave uh, and you've got two autoclaves, you can you can subscribe to get four a year and I think you save five pounds per logbook. So something to look into and, and it's on direct debit and they'll get sent and you don't need to and you don't need to remember to get them or anything like that. So yeah, just slightly adapting them. Yeah, that was that was Linda's just said she's using them, but she's slightly adapting them, which is really important that we actually when we did the development that you were able to adapt them it was uh something we were very keen on because i know i know that i know that if you no matter how efficient we try and make documents if you give them to a to a really great nurse she'll make them even more efficient that's what i've always seen or or they'll they'll turn them into what they need for their room 
Right. So we're uh, um, we're at five past one. We're at five past one now. Laura uh, Laura will bring up her deck in a second. Um, I'm Alex O'Neill. I'm the director of regulatory and professional services for Agilio, and uh, we're joined today by Laura from uh, Laura Edgar from Aura. Uh, Aura are are uh, very very well known for being the UK's sole. I've got this right. Sole supplier distributor for for Alpron. So they yep. are. So Laura is affectionately known as the Queen of Alpron, um, <laughs> and, and Laura and I know each other really, really well. Um, the reason um, reason for this webinar, part of the reason is is Laura's Laura's one of our Aura are one of our preferred partners. I'm going to put a poll up for a second because I think most people who are on this call are dental uh, eye compliant members. I think the vast majority of people here are. Um, so I will just put up a quick poll. I'd like to know, for those of you who have iComply or iTeam, so it's for iTeam subscribers as well, are you aware that you have access to a range of benefits and discounts from preferred partners, which include Aura, Chubb, uh, Life Environmental for risk assessments? We put together this partnership scheme, uh, which you get access to for a range of really good benefits. And I'm just wondering how many people are, are aware of it. We did, we did have, we did tell everybody just before Christmas, which I think, to be honest, that was my call and it was a bad idea. <laughs> so I'm just interested, I'm just interested in how, how many people are aware of it. So I'm going to put up a, put up a poll. Hopefully that's, that's appeared on the, uh, on everyone's screen. Has it appeared on yours, Aura? It has, yeah. Brilliant. I don't actually get to see it. It doesn't ask for my opinion. Okay. I've said yes. I know all about it. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see uh, what people come back and see if they've actually, if they've heard of it, are they aware of it? So I'll just wait a second for that to come back. Yeah, okay, so vast majority, uh, vast majority, 77% at the moment. Uh, I'll probably close the poll on that. That tells me everything I need to know. Uh, so we have, we've worked, you know, as an eye compliant and IT member, you know, you are, you are members of the largest compliance system and compliance company well, not just compliance company, health healthcare operate health dental healthcare operations support company in the UK. Um, hopefully, soon to to be international uh, as well. So the so we um, you know we we've spoken to a lot of people to get a range of discounts of things that we really think would benefit you. You know, Aura's on there with the reason that we we love Aura and and we we work with uh, with Laura is because one of the top things that we always see and have seen for the last 10 years on CQC inspection reports are comments along the lines of the decon decontamination nurse should familiarize herself with HTML 105 and things like that. So there is not in a rude way, kind of in the, the technical definition of the word, there are quite a lot of incompetent uh, decontamination leads out there in the profession. Uh, I'd say probably one in five practices I go into, I would strongly recommend Laura's course, actually it might even be higher than that, the course that they run, which is an ILM uh, recognized, uh, I think it's three days, is it, Laura? Uh, we do it over um, four days or two days, depending on whether you want to days. sit or the, sit and, and listen to it. All every, day. every single person, I'm going to go on that, this course for my update, every single person that I've recommended this course to have said it's been fantastic. So practice owners. And I ultimately think it's not just for your decon nurses, it's for your managers, it's for your practice owners. Because ultimately, especially if you're a practice owner, the only permanent team member you have is yourself. So so the so you know, if your if your decon lead wins wins the lottery, are they coming back the next day or are you gonna have to train a new decon lead? So you need this knowledge as well as a practice. It should be, you know, practice owner, practice manager, decon lead. I'd recommend everybody goes on this course. And uh, so we put a little pop up up. If it's already gone, do you know what? I'm going to put it up one more one more time. Uh, oh, hold on. Where's it gone? Uh, there we go. Right. So I'm just putting that up one more time. Um, if you click on that, that will take you to the page. You then do need to look at the different offers we do with different people. And you will need to email us or call us to ask us for the discount code. We're not gonna give away the discount code on a webinar that everyone can sit on. So it's only for, it's only for members, only a benefit for iComply and IT members. Um, so that's pretty much my introduction. Uh, so I'll, I'll hand over to Laura. She is the absolute 
UK, in my opinion, the UK expert on this. Um, and we, we asked Laura to give a, a really good overview of, to our members on kind of a Decom 101 was the brief. And uh, and yeah, and have a look at it, see what you think. And uh, and yeah, I'd, I'd really encourage people to go on, on Laura's course. So I'm going to disappear for a bit now and uh, I'll see you all in a bit. Over to you, Laura. Wonderful. Thank you. Very kind of Alex. I don't know. I don't know if I would say that I'm the, uh, uh, whatever you called me, the queen of Alpron, but very kind of you nonetheless. So um, hello, everybody. Um, I've got about 50 minutes, 45, 50 minutes to take you through what I know about decontamination, what the HTM or 105 tells us about decontamination and how um, we can use that document and use the different roles within the um, practice to make sure we are achieving um, successful decontamination and a safe outcome um, for our patients. So we're going to follow through some of the instruments um, on their journey. We're going to have a look at building a decontamination process in a dental setting um, and have a look at um, how that decontamination process is broken down. So all of the different parts of that, how effective or ineffective they might be um, so that we can try and achieve that safe compliance standard. Um, so in terms of objectives, this is what we're going to um, aim to get through. There's a lot to talk about, so forgive me if I talk uh, fast. There will be time for questions at the end, um, and we will be getting in touch afterwards anyway. So if there's anything that um, you, you want to ask and don't have time, don't worry, you'll still be able to get in touch with us. Um, so in terms of decontamination, I believe in a, a belt and braces approach to decontamination. And what I mean by that is that you need to put your trousers on and then make sure they stay up. So you've got to design a process to ensure that um, it, the process is safe, to ensure it's fit for purpose. And then you have to consistently apply that process. It's not good enough just to have a good process that's applied you know, on a quieter day or at the beginning of the day, but not at the end of the day. It has to be consistently applied every single time. So what I'm going to take you through really today is my five belt and braces focus areas, the, the, the five things that I would implore you to look at um, so that if the CQC do come, um, they'll be able to sign you off as safe um, and you'll be able to have you know personal assurance that what you're doing in practice is protecting yourself, protecting your team, protecting your patients from the risks that we know are there. So we'll have a look at leadership and those key roles. We will have a look at um, why we do decontamination, what the why is behind it all, because that's really important in my opinion. We'll look at the um, decon room configuration, so what um, what order things need to go in. Um, and then we'll put the stages of the decon cycle in there and look at the key elements of each of those stages as well, the, the detail behind that process. So let's get started. So the first um, belt and braces focus area really for me is understanding what decontamination is and how the key roles are going to work together to deliver safe and effective decontamination. Now, health is important to us all. It affects us all as individuals, our families, our, you know, the wider communities that we live in. And our health is protected by promoting well-being. Um, so preventing disease um, and making sure that we are controlling the spread of infection. Um, and that's a critical part of, of medical practice, of dental practice. So the practices that we use to prevent the spread of infection from one person to another, um, as you'll all know, are collectively referred to as infection prevention or infection control. And these include things like um, our immunizations, isolation of patients with specific diseases, and of course, decontamination of equipment, of environments and of surfaces. So if we think about um, decontamination, we know um, contamination refers to something being dirty or soiled. Decontamination then is the, is the means to render that safe for handling or safe for use again on a different patient or safe for disposal. And in a dental setting, when we think about decontamination, um, we use a, a variety of um, physical and chemical processes um, within our decontamination cycle. So we use a cleaning process and that's that removal of gross soil to make something clean. Clean is a subjective term, though in our case, we're thinking about that to mean visibly clean to our eyes under an inspection lamp and void of protein. So we use cleaning. 
We use disinfection, so that's the antimicrobial reduction of microorganisms down to a safe level on that surface. And we use both chemical disinfection and thermal disinfection to achieve that. And then we have sterilization. So we are trying to then eradicate um, all microorganisms on the surface um, of the um, instrument and make that safe for reuse then. So it's a decontamination is a complex multi-step um, process um, and certainly an, in, an integral part of our infection prevention practices. In order to make sure that the, the decontamination practices are um, working effectively, we need to have a team of people um, discharging all of the responsibilities within that. So um, the team keeping our decon rooms flying, in, in our case, is made up of a few different roles. Our practice manager, registered manager, the decon lead. We have a designated person role and then also users and operators. And understanding the ways in which um, this team can work together um, to communicate effectively, to overcome potential barriers, um, can make sure that our decontamination practices are safer as long as all of these team members are um, on board and working together. Now, teams are groups of individuals. Often they've got complementary skills. Um, and when we bring a group of individuals together, um, like we do in DECOM, we're doing that in order to achieve a specific goal. And over time, teams will evolve from a set of individuals into a cohesive unit. And we can see successful decontamination teams uh, differentiated from those that are not successful. And, the, and often the hallmarks are um, things like trust. The members within this team, the designated person, the users, the decon lead, they all trust one another. They have common goals, which are very clear. They have defined team roles and responsibilities, um, and they have um, great communication with one another that, that create group cohesion. And it means that they are able to achieve that specific goal far more easily and more effectively than teams that are just groups of individuals that have been put, put together without a thought about cohesion. So how you divide and create the roles within the practice is, is down to you. HTM um, gives you that freedom to utilize the roles that are available, um, but it requires that as a team, as a practice, and as a minimum, you can all show an understanding of the legal liabilities and current best practice. Everybody should know what they are legally, what duties of care they have, what liabilities they have, and what best practice um, currently is in accordance with HTM or WHTM or the SD set in Scotland, that you can demonstrate that you have obtained professional advice where necessary. Um, so uh, when you look at equipment purchase or maintenance um, testing or safe operation that you've um, worked with a, um, a professional in that, um, and certainly for things like um, pressure system safety regulations that you are using a competent person to do that type of um, servicing. Now, everybody who works within a technical field and decontamination is a technical field should have received training to be able to demonstrate that competency. Um, in our case, anybody who works in, controls or manages a decontamination process should understand the whole decontamination process end to end, not just the part that they do understand the roles and responsibilities that they hold and that of others. So where they, where they sit in the hierarchy understand how um, IPC underpins decontamination, how infection control underpins decontamination and the local policy, and how to do any um, periodic testing that they've been um, required to do. So if you are being asked to do a residual protein test or perform the helix test, that you have some training and know how to do that. So to break these roles down a little bit more, um, I thought we'd just look at them um, each in isolation. So designated person, first of all, um, think of this like your air traffic control. So this role is an interlink between what's going on in the practice and external support services. So this could be a set of activities and responsibilities that is undertaken by the decontamination lead. These roles are often combined, but in larger practices, having this secondary person for this role is beneficial. And this person would be the interface between your practice and its maintenance or its external service contractors. So they would be the one calling the service engineers. They would have 
and know the contact details um, for the engineer. They might also be able to do troubleshooting, for example, simple issues. They might have had additional training from the manufacturer or engineers, be able to access the FAQ documents easily, for example. So your designated person is a role that is an interlink, air traffic control. They're, they're on the plane, but they know no one um, on the ground as well. Next, we've got the users and the operators. So users, if we keep to the aeroplane analogy, is like your cabin crew manager. Again, a role often undertaken by the decon lead. So day-to-day -day responsibility for the management of the decon facility. And it's the user that is making sure that anybody working in the decon room is suitably trained, is competent. So they would review the operator's work. They might be um, doing audits or observations. They might be reviewing um, documentation to ensure compliance. So checking the logbooks have been filled in, for example. They might support with validation failures um, and generally just make sure that the decon room is running smoothly. The operators then are your cabin crew. So this is the, the team that are working in the decon facility. They should be trained to ensure their own and all patient safety. So they should know all of the protocols, all of the instructions, um, to make sure that there is consistency in the process that's being followed. They might also be carrying out the daily and weekly periodic testing. So you've got your user as your cabin crew manager, your operator is your cabin crew, um, and your designated person, your air traffic control. And then a couple of other ones, um, your registered manager, captain, ultimately captain of that aeroplane, if we keep to that analogy. So the person that holds ultimate responsibility um, for the practice, for the safety, for the provision of the service. Um, and this needs to be a strong leader, somebody who can role model behaviour because they need to put in place the, um, the decon lead and the designated person. Um, but that strong leader can't do it on their own. The, the registered manager can make a decon process um, strong and effective on their own. They need a strong team and they need to be able to delegate and inspire um, the best behaviours. Liability doesn't leave with delegation, so the book still stops with the registered manager. So it's in the best interest of the practice to ensure that all delegated roles are well trained so that you can delegate with confidence, but also as registered manager that you have a good depth of knowledge and understanding as well. Our decon lead then, I think of this like our technical lead, our flight engineer. So this needs to be a senior member of staff with responsibilities um, that cover managing all aspects of decontamination. So they should be creating the safe operating systems. They should be um, defining policy with an appreciation for all available current best practices and national guidance. They might provide um, or contribute to the plan for progression to best practice. If you're not there, they should be seeing and um, looking for improvements in what can be done, whether that's in process or in um, equipment or in training. They should be getting involved in purchasing of um, equipment and instruments to make sure they can be suitably decontaminated with the um, existing equipment that you have. They should be um, involved in the cleaning and decontamination um, policy and looking at how um, equipment is maintained and disposed. The decontamination lead role is one that's enshrined in the Health and Social Care Act. It's a requirement of law um, to make sure that all users of the decon facility are suitably trained. And as a decon lead, you will be developing your team. You'll be guiding, coaching, training others. You should be taking the lead in induction training, making sure that that is fit for purpose in your practice so that you know nobody sets foot into your decon room who is not competent and who you cannot evidence to the CQC um, of that competence as well. The decon lead should also be involved in preparing the annual statement that's a requirement under the Health and Social Care Act as well, so detailing progress, incidents, um, lessons taken away from that, training, risk assessments done, that sort of thing. And your decon lead is accountable to the registered manager. You know, you're a key team player supporting the operators who work in the decon room um, and undertaking often, like I said, lots of other roles as well. So it's important that um, that, that role is one that is well trained. As Alex said earlier, it's one that has been highlighted on CQC uh, shortfalls several times about a lack of competency and insufficient training. 
Um, so it's important that we have the technical knowledge, but this is a leadership role. So we also need um, people who can role model um, and who can coach and support other team members to inspire the best behaviours in our decon rooms. And using these roles to delegate out um, tasks means that each person can excel so you know you might be in a practice where you don't have a designated person or you don't have the user operator structure you have the ability to implement these if you want to and it means that you can delegate tasks and have a team far more engaged in providing safety contamination um, so each person contributing in their own way also inspires a greater sense of team it provokes a really positive culture when everybody feels like they are um, all going for the same goal but all contributing something very um, personal to them so i'd ask you to think about your practice think about how you share your roles and responsibilities do you know what your role is do you have the clarity and purpose um, in in the roles in your practice so to bring the team together, obviously you need you need that leader, you need your decontamination lead, um, and you need that person to be strong and effective. Um, I thought I'd just take a moment to explain um, what leadership is and what a leader does and why ineffective leaders can damage our ability to produce safe, clean instruments. Um, so leadership is a process by which one individual um, influences the behaviours, the attitudes, the thoughts of others. And a, a leader's action become a set of um, unspoken standards. You know, you set the tone as to what is appropriate and what is not. In the 90s, 1980s, um, when uh, AIDS had arrived um, on the world stage, um, there was a, a really poignant example um, of leadership that I always uh, reference. So it was a very different time. There was a new frightening disease. There was no cure. There was um, lots of miscommunication um, going on about it. And people genuinely believed that you could catch it from touching somebody who had it or sitting on the same toilet seat, for example. And that meant that lots of um, sufferers were, were shunned. There was some horrendous polls. One poll in America suggested that 50% of the population believed that anybody with AIDS should be quarantined and, and sent away. And then on the 19th of April in 1987, um, Princess Diana, one of the most famous people in the world at that point, opened the first unit in the UK dedicated to treating people with HIV and AIDS. And during that visit, she was photographed shaking um, hands with a patient um, without wearing any gloves. And that act itself changed people's perceptions of the disease forever she was role modeling she was showing the way and that changes perception and inspires action now leaders lead people they influence they inspire they support and they develop confidence leaders do the right thing they're the ones who role model who show the way there's only sort of two ways normally of changing somebody else's behavior you've either got to inspire them to be, do something differently or influence them and we can influence people's behavior by adding pressure so we can use things like um, perceived threat or money or using authority it's like the old carrot and stick approach so to influence you've got to add some sort of pressure and like I say the carrot and the the stick type mentality Alternatively, you can throw all the carrots and all the sticks away and just inspire people to want to do something, inspire people to follow you in what you're doing. And that for me is what a great decontamination lead can do in practice. Leadership, though, on its own wouldn't be enough because we need um, the skill set that we see in managers as well. Management is getting the things done that we need to get done, processes, systems, audits. Managers and that management quality um, manage processes within a controlled environment usually. So they have um, attention to detail, making sure the functions of a system perform correctly. So in decontamination, I think we need both skill sets. We need leadership to focus on the people-centered activities so that their um, function is to create and communicate a vision to energize and inspire action. And then we need effective management processes to make sure that the decontamination is being um, repeated consistently so that we have the right types of processes and functions and they're happening over and over again. 
Now we need that um, that uh, synergy between the leadership and the management so that you get a clarity of purpose, you get consistency in application and you get efficiency in process. So that would be my belt and braces area number one, grow a strong team with a clear division and lead with inspiration. Make sure everybody knows what they're doing and you stood at the front if you're decon lead or registered manager, you are leading with inspiration and your team are um, inspired to follow behind. The second area is thinking about the why. You've always got to start with why. So once you've got your leaders and your managers and you're working in sync and you've got that, um, that uh, those qualities, we need to think about why we're doing it in the pursuit of any outcome. In this case, it's thinking about a decom process. We have to start with why. So do your teams understand why we do decontamination? Do you understand why we do decontamination? Why we have layers of process and procedures? Why we check and test and validate every single stage? Understanding the reasons behind decontamination and the um, ethical basis that drives improvement in decontamination is really, really important. And as the decon lead, one of the key roles is to bring that why to life. So I thought I'd um, just go through a couple of the reasons why. There's loads and loads of these. So the, the first one is the development and the understanding of risk. History teaches us to improve, to change and to adapt. And we've seen loads of opportunities over the years um, to do this. It, it normally occurs during or shortly after a crisis, a pandemic or some sort of incident. And we're very much um, living this process right now, you know, um, where we have um, post COVID lessons that we're taking into um, our new procedures. But I'd ask you to cast your minds back through your careers, long and short, and just imagine what decontamination infection control looked like when you first joined. And then consider what's changed in practice. And I wonder if you can link those changes to a learning experience that occurred before it. Like I said, COVID gave, gives us loads of examples, but to pick one, we now have an understanding and appreciation for um, things like air exchanges and ventilation in a way that, that we didn't before um, COVID was a thing. And we've seen loads of examples over the years from CJD to AIDS. We've seen gloves and PPE introduced. We've had a development of how we process instruments, how we segregate the decon facility, all designed to improve and to change um, and adapt based on a new understanding of risk. A second why would be our duty, our duty of care as professionals, as registered indemnified clinical specialists in your area. There exists a binding contract between you and your patients to ensure that nothing in the clinical environment introduces them to harm and that a safe and clean environment is provided as part of their treatment. So that's why we're measuring out the chlorine in the water to make the right solution. That's why we're flushing our dental unit water lines. It's why we're meticulously washing our hands using the right technique. It's because we have a duty of care. It's our principle number one from our GDC standards. So there's lots and lots of whys. And I'd ask you to think about what's your why? Why is decontamination important to you? Why would you attend a lecture on decontamination on your lunch hour? Because if you can share that, you can inspire others to want to do it. So being a great decontamination lead is needs the why, but it's more than just the why, because the, the why gives you the starting point, but you need to progress and get a strong knowledge base as well. So to appreciate the range of um, skills and knowledge that you uh, need to have, um, we've got to compare com bind together the technical knowledge that you need as well as hands-on experience because it's the hands-on experience that gives you context it gives you the um, examples of when you've been able to convert theory into practice um, and so we need not only the um, technical theoretical knowledge but we need experience doing that as well um, one without the other is just not as strong and there's a lot to take in. There's loads of regulations and guidance and documents to understand um, and interpret. You need your soft management and leadership skills. You need to be able to listen and communicate and delegate and solve problems. 
Um, and then you need your practical still skills as well. You know, how to um, unlock an autoclave if it gets um, locked on a fault, how to um, do a residual protein test or clean hand pieces correctly. So it's important to get um, competent in decontamination leadership um, and confident um, with your team um, and looking for those improvement opportunities. As Alex mentioned earlier, we, we have a course that helps um, practices do that. So either a new to role decon lead, um, non-clinical um, registered managers, it's been um, really, really helpful for anybody who's involved in um, in decontamination, whether that's a user operator, designated person, decon lead, even dentists, we've had um, you know a fantastic range of clin clinicians who've attended as well. If you want to appreciate the knowledge base required, then the, the ILM course that we do here at Aura um, might be just the thing for you. The next belt and braces um, area is the decontamination of equipment. And we're going to dig here into that um, decontamination cycle. So bear in mind, decontamination of equipment is a standard precaution. So it is a standard infection control precaution that we are applying. Remember that standard infection control precautions are to be used by all staff in all care settings at all times for all patients, whether infection is known to be present or not. So to ensure the safety of those being cared for, the, the staff, the visitors, anybody in the care environment, we use these standard precautions. We consistently apply the same procedures over and over again. Because there's no way of knowing who potentially could be infected, the application of those standard precautions is to all patients at all times. It ensures best practice becomes second nature and the risks of infection then are minimised. And the objective of our standard precautions is to break the chain of infection, to reduce the opportunity for infections to spread. So this is the standard for decontamination process consistency. We don't only do it when we aren't busy or when the instruments look dirty. We don't use different processes for different times of day or different staff levels, but the same process every time for every instrument, every time, because that's the only way a standard precaution is applied effectively. So let's have a look at this decontamination cycle. Um, so decontamination, like we said earlier, physical, chemical means to render the surface of an item safe for handling, safe, safe for use or safe for disposal. It is a multidisciplinary approach. So um, decontamination is not just a physical process. It has standards, policies, procedures. We have to control the environment. The um, We have to um, involve things like incident investigation, education, training, periodic testing. Um, so decontamination of equipment includes more than just the scrubbing of the instruments or putting them in, in the autoclave. The goal of decontamination is to remove, reduce microbial load to a level that is safe to use with or on patients, to ensure that no toxic substances remain on the surface that could cause a negative patient reaction, and to ensure that the decon cycle doesn't damage the instrument so it is compatible with the load item as well. We want to try as far as possible to, to mitigate um, and reduce any damage to the environment as well. So here's our cycle of decontamination. Hopefully this is um, familiar to you. And we are going to um, perform this cycle within our decon room. And our decontamination room um, should be built um, to perform some clear functions. So the design, the suitability, um, and some different factors that make it fit for purpose um, should um, include things like the zoning, um, that we know exactly um, at every point in the room and every area in the room what that area is for. What are we going to be doing um, in that particular area? Is it a clean area or a dirty area? Your decon room should um, also be able to meet the workload demands. So um, maintaining a fresh supply of reusable items. And that might mean you have to consider including within your decon room design the use of automated um, processes or machines. And think about the demands that they then have on space and water and power. The room should be such that it reduces the risk of accidental mixing of dirty and clean 
um, items or disinfected and sterilized items so that cross-contamination is minimized. And we do that with zoning, with clear and unambiguous signage, color-coded labels that indicate what the function each area is for, um, and a clutter-free environment. So only the equipment and the materials required to complete that function are included. The design and workflow of your decon room is important. It helps you maintain a safe and effective service. So we should have a workflow running from dirty to clean, and we should have an airflow um, such that it is controlled, it's directional, and it moves clean to dirty. Open windows, um, ceiling or desk fans would not be an appropriate method because they will disperse the air in a um, randomly. So there would be no concern for the cross-infection risk if you had randomized um, air movement within your decon room. We should include things like our PPE, our hand hygiene facilities should be provided, stocked regularly, their correct use audited, um, and everything should be in its place and to hand for the operator. We shouldn't be rifling through cupboards. Access to the decon room should be limited and controlled. Only those permitted to work should be entering. Only those competent to work should be entering. And that comes from robust training. So that needs to be provided along with the auditing and the observation so that you have the highest standard of consistency. So let's start with our um, basics. Our decon room is built. We've got our hand wash sink and our PPE station. We've decided upon a workflow. So remember our airflow is moving in the opposite direction to that of the workflow. We can start to now put our decon process together. So we'll first think about transportation. Um, and it's important to make sure that instruments are handled and transported safely to reduce the, um, the chance of any risk to staff, to subsequent patients and to make sure that those items remain undamaged. Um, all of the instruments that we put within our transport boxes are at risk of damage due to mechanic mechanical shock. So if you drop or strike another instrument, that would cause potential mechanical shock or stress. So bending or being placed under heavier, heavier items. The safe handling and transport of instruments is the responsibility of the staff member involved and all items um, will be um, potentially contaminated with pathogenic microorganisms. So these need to be considered, considered hazardous. And um, we need to make sure that before we start our transportation process, we are segregating our items effectively at point of use and disposing of them appropriately. We should be placing those items then in a transportation box, which should be labeled for function, um, color coded ideally. Um, and all um, items should be then moved quickly without delay to the decon room. Now we want to make sure that we're moving them without delay because any drying time is going to have a negative impact on um, the ability to um, have successful cleaning and, and decontamination. So we know that proteins are gonna bond onto metal when you heat it above 45 degrees, but proteins will also bond onto metal and become quite sticky if you leave them to air dry or dry for 30 minutes, 45 minutes. The longer they dry, the harder it is to remove that contamination. So moving them without delay is important. Um, and transportation should be um, undertaken by trained staff. They should be delivered to a set down area in the decon room, located immediately after the entrance to the decon room and large enough to fit the transportation box. It could be racking to allow for several boxes to be received without them being piled on top of each other. And at that point, the hand washing should be undertaken, fresh PPE applied. Um, and um, it can be helpful, I think, to have colour coded PPE. So red aprons can provide a visual aid to staff um, if you've got people coming in and out. So, you know, that you're doing a dirty process at that point. We can then consider our cleaning procedure. So cleaning is a process that's going to remove dirt, dust, large numbers of microorganisms, any organic matter that protects them. And it is an important um, prerequisite to disinfection and sterilization. It's a fundamental step in decon and one that allows for the following steps to be successful. Um, cleaning is a subjective term, so it's not always easy to measure. Um, and clean isn't a scientifically defined term either. It's a relative concept. So we are going to clean our items um, so that they are um, visibly clean to our 
um, inspection under an inspection lamp um, and we're going to use things like residual protein tests to make sure they are clean and void of protein. We know that retained soil um, on the surface of an instrument will inhibit the disinfection and sterilization stages so we need to make sure that this stage is completed effectively. Now we have um, some options for our cleaning. Um, we can um, use manual cleaning, we can use a um, uh, ultrasonic bath or we can use an automated cleaning process in a washer disinfector. Whichever process you choose it needs to be compatible with your device um, and the decon lead should be involved in the procurement of the instruments and the devices to make sure that you're not buying something that can't be processed with your current methods. If we consider manual cleaning first of all manual cleaning governed by an appropriate protocol is acceptable within um, EQR central quality requirements framework and in principle manual cleaning is the simplest method to set up um, but it is difficult to validate because it's difficult to ensure that what's being carried out um, is the same on every occasion um, and compared to other cleaning methods manual cleaning presents a greater risk of inoculation injury to staff um, that being said, all practices need to have a manual cleaning protocol and backup um, in case other methods are not available or not appropriate. So your manual cleaning policy and procedure should be nice and detailed. It should, um, it should uh, present what the technique is to be used. So the immersion technique, keeping the item underwater. Um, the water temperature should be stated or a range stated. The solution and dilution that you have um, chosen as well as the brush. Um, rem remember you want a nylon bristled brush, no metal brushes. Um, and like I say, a predetermined method and time framed, um, ideally signed um, by the user so that that can be audited to compete, uh, to confirm repeatability as well. Um, you would be making sure that you wear um, your protective clothing, so manual cleaning gloves, for example, um, and all of these bits of equipment, manual cleaning gloves and um, brushes should be inspected each time to make sure they are safe to use, that they are suitable. Um, certainly if they're autoclavable, um, you may need to replace them. So you need to think about the equipment that you're using for this. You would be using your um, dirty sink. You'd fill your dirty sink with the appropriate amount of water and a detergent. You might be using a detergent and a disinfectant. In most cases, it's just a detergent. And then brushing, agitating um, your instruments using a manual cleaning brush to make sure that you are covering all areas of the instrument surface area. The um, cleaning is predicated on friction, water, and a detergent. So it needs those three items to be successful. So let's pop our sinks in for our manual cleaning. So you would have at this point three sinks, your hand wash sink, your dirty and your rinse sink. Bowls are allowed, but they have to be designated for use. And your equipment would be close by, your thermometer, your nylon brushes, your autoclavable gloves, your logs or log books for manual cleaning. You might have timers as well if you have a specific contact time that you need to meet. And this process should be observed. So you should be able to um, watch this process consistently happen the same way, no matter what time of day, what user is doing it. Um, and if that's not the case, you should be able to take some learning from that. The next option is a semi-automated cleaning process, which is the use of a ultrasonic bath. Um, ultrasonic baths use um, sound waves um, like a, a high frequency sound wave to cause disruption and removal of soil from the surface um, through a process called cavitation. Um, so your items would be initially, um, before they go in an ultrasonic bath, submerged in a water and cleaning solution um, and then subjected to cavitation. And you need to follow your manufacturer's advice and the evidence from your validation testing to support your decision about the most appropriate cycle time. Um, you know, a bath with a smaller bath with only two or three transducers for, versus a much bigger bath, um, you know, you will have a difference in cycle time. It'll also vary depending on the um, level of contamination on your instruments, the material of instrument, the different type of detergent that you use. Um, so you must make sure that you're validating your, um, your cycle time for your practice. Ultrasonic cleaning is a fantastic way of enhancing removal of debris. Um, although a washer disinfector is preferred um, and it should be incorporated into new plans or upgrades, ultrasonic cleaners 
when we're using them um, in the right way, when they're fit for purpose, um, can be very helpful um, for instruments with hinges or um, intricate parts. Um, we must make sure we're degassing our ultrasonic baths prior to use um, to ensure that there's sufficient activity and items should be briefly immersed in a detergent solution to remove any gross contamination before they go into the ultrasonic bath. So ultrasonic bath on its own um, is not a process. You can't go dirty box to ultrasonic bath without stepping into a um, detergent solution stage first. Um, and making sure that we have um, a good eye on our um, solution changing. So every four hours, if it looks cloudy or contaminated, or if your manufacturer of your detergent says it only has a certain lifespan on it. But again, that's down to um, the practice to, um, to manage that and to consider that. So let's pop our ultrasonic bath in. Um, you can see it sits in between the two sinks and that is because there is no rinse cycle on an ultrasonic bath. Therefore, items that come out need to go through the rinse stage um, before they then move on. Final uh, choice for your um, cleaning stage would be um, using an automated process. So using an automated validated washer disinfector is, is in preference to manual cleaning because it includes a disinfection stage that renders instruments safe for handling and uh, inspection. Um, and it's the preferred method for cleaning dental instruments because it offers the best control and reproducibility of cleaning. And it's a process that can be validated. The um, washer disinfectors will go um, through the same five stages. So they subject instruments to a flush, first of all, so to remove any water soluble proteins and gross contamination. It will then wash instruments, dosing a set amount of um, detergent or deter detergent and disinfectant, depending on what you use. It will then rinse items before thermally disinfecting them. And thermal disinfection is achieved by subjecting these items to a 90 degree temperature for a one minute holding time. Data loggers can record this and the printing allows, whether that's printed off or uh, data logged, to sign off that each of those batch of instruments has been subjected to the parameters required for disinfection. And that means that we have evidence and that's a validated process. It's much safer for, um, for staff as well. So we can pop our washer disinfector in. Um, our cleaning processes are completed. So either using manual sinks, ultrasonic baths or a washer disinfector, um, all of which sit in the dirty zone of the decon room. And it's important to note that, um, as I said, the location of the ultrasonic bath is um, in between the sinks to allow for rinsing if possible. So if you've used a, a disinfectant or you've employed thermal disinfection, then you've also completed the disinfection stage. Up till this point, we've uh, I've really only been talking about solid items. Um, so give a thought to your handpiece decontamination. Lumined items also need to be considered in this decontamination cycle. Um, there is um, lots of evidence that confirms the presence of contamination within dental handpieces. Several studies have um, been performed on the different efficacies of the methods of cleaning and disinfection um, around hollow instruments. Um, so we know that um, hand pieces are a weak point in the decon cycle, that there is the presence of um, different microorganisms inside dental hollow instruments, um, and that's been determined on several studies. So thinking about how we clean these hand pieces is important. Now, there are automated options. There are manual options for cleaning and disinfection, um, which sit to one side from oiling. Oiling on its own is not cleaning. Oil is going to lubricate the internal surfaces, but is not going to clean or disinfect them. So you can use um, automated processes such as putting hand pieces in washer disinfectors if they are validated to go through that. Um, you can use semi-automated methods where you have um, machines. Lots of the handpiece manufacturers have these where they do a cleansing or cleaning process and then also oil them. Or there are manual processes where you can spray um, cleaning and disinfection chemistries through and you can then um, oil them at the end. So let's pop those in. We've got our handpiece um, cleaning um, 
uh, area and then we've also popped in our inspection and our inspection should be conducted in a in a specified clean area it should be separated by space or a physical divider and labeled as such and there needs to be sufficient area to properly inspect instruments and um, so you should have the relevant materials to hand and um, that would include having a inspection lamp and um, making sure that we have some lint-free cloths so that we can interrogate all of those processes up to that point to make sure these items are um, clean visibly clean there is no pitting or damage or rusting and um, there is no breakages um, and everything that you're passing by this inspection point is safe to be used on a patient um, you need to make sure your lamp um, ideally has two um, dioptic so it has the the main magnification and then an additional magnification as well and once we inspect and sign them off that means we can put them through to our um, final stage of sterilization and this is what we're going to use to render a surface free from viable um, microorganisms including spores and um, it would not uh, necessarily deal with things like prions and um, they would not be effectively destroyed by this process now in um in our country we have three different types of autoclave in use in practice so we have type b or vacuum autoclaves n or non-vacuum autoclaves and s types and um, they are all designed for a different um load type so b or vacuum autoclaves can process any load porous materials products in pouches textiles hollow items, hand pieces, for example. And that's because type B or vacuum autoclaves use steam um, under pressure and achieve that pressure by using a vacuum. So they are um, active at sucking out the air from the chamber. By contrast, an N-type autoclave is designed for sterilizing simple materials. The N stands for naked solid products. Therefore, these autoclaves are used for um, solid items, um, they shouldn't be used for textiles, porous loads, hollow items, um, even putting something in a pouch would present too much of, it, of a challenge for these types of autoclaves. Um, so it's a weakness of these types of um, autoclaves that steam penetration cannot be guaranteed into um, lumined items. And then your S types sit as a, a classification sort of between the two, uh, between an N and a B. Um, and their characteristics are only defined by the manufacturer rather than by a universal standard. So a DAC is a good example of an S-type autoclave that's just designed for dental hand pieces. So um, we would then follow our successful sterilization cycle with a second inspection. We want to be making sure that we um, are not finding any wet pouches when they come out of the autoclave. Um, that they are, if they're pouched after they've gone through the autoclave, that they are allowed to dry um, or cool down and dry effectively, and that we are being mindful of keeping those items um, sterilized um, so that they are um, safe for reuse. Um, we want to make sure that the um, inspection stage also signs off that any validation that was used has passed before we um, move them on. So if you use a, a type one indicator on the side of a pouch or if you've put a TST strip in there, we are also checking and signing off to say that those parameters have been met. Again, a magnification lamp should be used to aid the visual inspection of each of the items. We're still looking for damage for retained soil. and um, It's your second opportunity to make sure um, that nothing is going to get put into storage um, that shouldn't be. Um, and then we can store in a safe and suitable environment. So we want to protect instruments against the possibility of recontamination by maintaining that barrier. You've just put loads of effort into getting these items to be um, in a state of either sterile if they're in a pouch before they go into the autoclave or sterilized. And um, so we need to make sure that we then maintain that barrier. Um, so storage areas could be within surgery. They could be in the um, clean side of the decon room or in a third area. Um, best practice requires that clean storage is done in a separate environment. So ideally um, not in the surgery. Um, but, and the storage should allow for good rotation of stock, easy identification of the pack expiry dates. It should be cool and dry and away from direct sunlight above floor level, for example. <sighs> And we've come to the end. I feel like I sped up towards the end there. So we've come to the end. That cycle, when it is completed with due attention to each stage, can be very effective. You know, by the right person with the right training and the right support, 
um, decontamination can be highly effective. But we also know when we have gaps, when that process isn't quite right or applied correctly, problems can arrive. So I would encourage everybody to have a look at their decontamination processes, observe it, watch the life of an instrument moving around your decon room. And for you decon leads, make clear the role that you hold and the responsibilities that you have and lead, inspire others to want to put the attention to detail on each one of these stages. Make sure you've got a compelling why and keep your tools sharp with development and training. Make sure you come and talk to us about that ILM course. And that is all.